Hola a todos y todas. Eh, estamos acá para hacer una entrevista con Manuel Albers. Manuel Albers es eh, profesor del Departamento de Geografía Humana eh, de la Universidad de Lovaina, en la, Católica, la Universidad Católica de Lovaina en Bélgica. Eh, y vino invitado a la conferencia eh, CDEUS COES eh, eh, ahora en noviembre. Eh, lamentablemente por el estallido social que hemos tenido en Chile, eh, la, con, la conferencia tuvo que ser cancelada, sin embargo, igual hemos hecho algunas actividades eh, más públicas y más ciudadanas con él, eh, y además queríamos hacer esta entrevista para preguntarle sobre algunas cosas de su trabajo, pero también cómo podemos conectarlas con lo que pasa en Chile. Uh, so, now we're going to start the interview. Um, Manuel, thank you for coming. Uh, to Chile and thank you for coming to uh, this interview. So in order to start, um, can you tell us uh, a little bit about what are the main areas of your academic research or work? Yeah. Thank you for inviting me, happy to be here. Um, so I work mostly in the intersection of real estate, finance and the state. Um, I come from a background where I studied urban planning, urban sociology, did my PhD in human geography. Uh, I was always interested in housing issues and urban issues and throughout time I became more interested in more economic and financial issues. I came to the realization that if I want to understand what happens in the city, if what happens in housing markets, I need to understand also better how the economy works, how finance works within real estate, within the city more widely speaking. Um, so I started to investigate a lot of processes people would think of economic. Uh, but many of those processes are not researched to the full extent by economists, let's put it that way. Um, they might not be interested in the same questions urban researchers are interested in. Um, and for a long time people have said a lot of these financial issues are too difficult for us other social scientists to deal with, we leave it to economists. I think since the crisis 2008-2009 in the global north, Um, people are increasingly seeing this is no longer uh, a fellow document and if we want to understand society or the urban, the housing, uh, we have to understand also the financial. Mm -hmm. So what I've been trying to do is integrate perspectives on the one hand from political economy, looking more at the interaction between states uh, on the one hand and finance on the other hand, in to integrate it with perspectives from urban studies which are much better at understanding the local state. Uh, and looking at processes of housing, for instance, or commercial real estate. So try to bring together these different levels of analysis, as well as different uh, focal points. Mm -hmm. um, can you describe the concept of the real estate financial complex, and how is this related with Lefebvre's and Harvey's ideas on the two circuits of capital? Yeah, so the way I try to bring together these, these different literatures is through a concept that I call the real estate financial complex. Um, so there's an analogy there with uh, the military industrial complex, of course, that is meant as a, you could say, I'm, I'm, it's a wink to another concept. Um, and I'm basically arguing that people back in the day were saying specifically for the US, but also for some other countries, the military and the industry are so much intertwined Uh, and by that, the state and the corporate sector are intertwined. Mm -hmm. I'm arguing that the real estate sector, the financial sector and the state are becoming increasingly interdependent. Real estate has always been dependent on finance. Uh, finance and the state have always been intertwined. But I think we see increasing interdependencies between these two sectors by themselves. From when? Fr from which period onwards, yeah. you mean? Um, well, I think that's different for different countries. Mm -hmm. um, and I think the 1970s in many countries mm -hmm. are uh, a big shift. And that has to do with the energy crisis. Mm -hmm. That has to do with the industrial crisis in the global north. Mm -hmm. uh, it has to do with neoliberalism, a, a phenomenon you are more familiar with because you've lived through it in this country in a much more fuller extent than we have in many other countries. And I think this coming together of a, of a number of trends Uh, I think here there might be other uh, processes that are more important. Uh, this is my first time in Chile, I haven't studied Chile. But for instance, in a number of um, uh, earlier industrializing countries, it's the crisis of industrialization, uh, where at some point these countries used to be industrial powerhouses, they are no longer industrial powerhouses. How do they make money? And the economic sectors that are increasing are real estate and finance. Mm -hmm. and When 15 years ago people were seeing these similar kind of processes in the global north, nowadays I think increasingly people are describing this also in the global south, where real estate is becoming a growth sector, finance is becoming a growth sector. 
Um, and where the connections with the state were always there, I think they are increasing partly because these economic sectors are so important, mm -hmm. partly because politicians rely so heavily on them. Mm -hmm. um, and I think in real estate, in a way, at the local level, this is a very long-standing trend. Mm -hmm. uh, but I think at the national level, to rely on real estate and the real, real estate investments mm -hmm. is, in a way, a, a more recent trend that definitely since the 80s and 90s is becoming much more visible. Because um, I think local politicians for a long time have relied on real estate. Um, if you want to do uh, local projects, sort of the idea of the growth machines, 1970s, 1980s literature, this was already discussed. But it was very much local level, you want to do local projects. Uh, but in a way now, it's not just real estate development or the building of housing. Uh, it is very much also the investment in housing, which is often is also existing housing, that is becoming something uh, important for governments. Mm -hmm. Uh, we see also regulation spreading. So uh, some regulation often started first in the US. Mortgage securitization is something that's spreading across the globe. Uh, where again, 20 years ago, people were saying this is a global north phenomenon. This is increasingly becoming also many global south countries are having market securitization. Another important one, real estate investment trusts. Um, actually, some global south countries were much earlier here than global north countries. Brazil, for instance, 1993. Uh, already had real estate investment trust. Many European countries only did it in the, in the 21st century. Mm -hmm. This is another vehicle. These are both vehicles to connect real estate mm -hmm. and finance because they make it possible to invest in real estate at a much higher scale, mm -hmm. to make it possible to invest in real estate in other countries mm -hmm. uh, that you don't have the local knowledge. So this is another important element of this real estate financial complex. Mm -hmm. It's also a rescaling taking place. On the one hand, of course, real estate remains local. Where well, you can see real estate is always mm -hmm. specialized, it's always local in that sense. But the investment of it is becoming increasingly international. Mm -hmm. So I was, as I was asking, is this, uh, how is this connected with the two circuits yes, of capital, right. this financial complex? Yes, so uh, the circuits of capital, well, the first, you could say the, 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 the production circuits, uh, including agriculture, but uh, importantly in the, in the industry. Uh, manufacturing, uh, the secondary circuit real estate. So in a way, uh, what Harvey is describing where um, overaccumulation in the primary circuits leads to investment in the secondary circuits into real estate, into infrastructure. In a way, we see this more in intensified now. So we see a sh shifting to the secondary circuits, but um, in a way it goes beyond what Harvey had said. And some people would say Harvey was wrong. I would say um, he was more right than he could anticipate. Mm -hmm. um, because he is arguing in a way, it's the overaccumulation in the primary circuits in manufacturing that leads at some point to investment in the secondary circuit because you can make more money in the secondary circuit and then it switches. What we see now is that it's not just a switching anymore when there's overaccumulation in the primary circuit. There's almost a constant overaccumulation in the secondary circuit because in many places, in many moments in time, you can make more money through real estate than you can go than you can do through manufacturing. So in that sense, I think um, Harvey, when he wrote about this in the 70s and 80s, he didn't realize this was going much further. Um, of course, Harvey has still written a lot about this in recent years, but he's never used this lens of the circuits anymore. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't like to invite Harvey to say, go back to your analysis of the 70s and 80s, yeah. try to do it to the circuits, what do you see now? Like, mm -hmm. if it's no longer overaccumulation in the primary circuit, what, what happens that all these investments happens in the secondary circuits? Because he would say, well, you get a crisis in the primary circuit, it goes to the secondary circuit. What we see now is whether the economy is doing well or not, there's investment in the secondary circuit. Mm -hmm. If the primary circuit is not doing well, people may uh, go for safer investments in the secondary circuit. If it's going well in the primary circuit, the investments happen anyway because there's still an overflow. And I think on top of that, you see something that I've called the quaternary circuit. Of course, Harvey and Levertre describe a tertiary circuit, which is basically uh, innovation, the welfare state, uh, healthcare, uh, which Harvey hasn't talked much about yet. I don't talk about, about much that either. And as a more like a thought experiment than actually a pure analytical tool, I try to think about the quaternary circuit where the money just flows around in the financial sector. Mm -hmm. Where the financial sector becomes a sector in and for itself, uh, just like the capital class can be there in and for itself. Uh, and this quaternary circuit, I, I am not convinced it is the best way to argue it, but um, that's why I said it's more a thought experiment than a pure um, structural theory that I've developed. Mm -hmm. 
where you now see some of the circulation of capital is happening just in the financial sector itself. Mm -hmm. And if it's switching, it's, it's, it's shifting or switching between the secondary and the quaternary circuit of capital, and not even uh, between the primary. The primary doesn't even come up in some of the pictures anymore. And that's what you see very much with this process like securitization, uh, with a lot of forms of derivatives. I mean, a lot of derivatives, if you add up the amount of money that goes around derivatives, it is multiple times the global economy. So this is very hard for us to imagine that there's more money in derivatives than there is in the global GDP. Um, which means that this money goes around in a quaternary circuit, yeah. which is not even directly interacting anymore with the primary or the secondary circuit. We don't touch it really. We can't touch it. Yeah. And then, you know, when, when the crisis hit in 2008, people were saying like, oh, we lost so many billion. Well, the, the money was, was never really there, right? So did we lose it? I mean, money was lost by people who lost their homes. Uh -huh. But a lot of the money that was lost on paper was money in derivatives that was never realized. It was fictitious in, in the most uh, literal sense of fictitious. We can discuss what's fictitious and what's not. I still find that a very difficult concept. But for derivatives, it was purely fictitious. A lot of it wasn't securities based on housing. It was betting on the security based on housing. Uh, the Big Short is a, is a popular movie that many people have seen. It's not 100% correct, but it is probably 98% correct. And they show very nicely how there were some people who were not just taking out products on housing, mm -hmm. like securities, but they were betting on the securities that other people were owning. Mm -hmm. And investment banks themselves were betting, on the, betting against the products they were giving out. I mean, this is such a different sphere mm -hmm. where the money just circulates, that this goes beyond um, a lot of the things I think Harvey and Lefebvre talked about, because they didn't exist in those days. Yeah. So back to Chile, uh, as you saw in the activity on Tuesday, um, prices are growing very fast in Chile as well. Uh, mm -hmm. Can you explain the role that financial institutions are currently having on housing prices? Yeah, I mean, of course, as I said, I'm not an expert on Chile. This is my first time. I haven't studied Chile. I, I know a little bit more about some other Latin American countries, particularly Brazil, a little bit about Argentina. Uh, but what we see in many countries around the world is that over time, um, mortgage finance has become more important. So people rely more heavily um, on finance through lenders, uh, often in most countries banks, but not necessarily banks. And this is one component, um, which in the beginning seems nice. If you want to buy a house, um, houses are expensive, you can get a mortgage, it helps you to buy the house. So in the beginning, a mortgage loan is a very utilitarian product, you could almost say. I never used that term, it just came to me. It's a utilitarian product in the beginning. Um, but uh, how I explain it to my students is that let's say you are the only one who gets a mortgage loan. It's great, you can buy now a larger house, a bigger house, a more expensive house than you could do before because you could pull some money of yourself, maybe some money of your parents, plus the mortgage loan, you can get a bigger house. That all seems nice. Uh, and if the mortgage market would work at large like that, it's, it would be great. Um, but the thing, of course, happens. If everyone gets a mortgage loan, it just means that everyone can, build, can buy a bigger house or a more expensive one, which just means they're driving up the prices. So when mortgages are first introduced in a country, it's usually, for the middle classes, it's a way to get better housing. Uh, the rich people usually didn't need mortgages, they have family capital, but the middle classes who use a combination of their own capital, sometimes a little bit of family money, and then the mortgage loan really helps them to buy something. In the beginning, when mortgages are introduced in a country, this is really uh, uh, very beneficial for a very specific group of society. But then once the mortgage market is expanding, it just means more and more people can borrow money and therefore derive the price of the housing market. And what we see is that typically once mortgage markets are introduced, they start to be expanded to larger parts of the population. Mm -hmm. And this is in a way you could say is the rationale of, of, of markets. They want to expand. And of course, if middle classes now pay more for housing, it starts with the upper middle classes, then the lower middle classes say, oh, I need a mortgage too, otherwise I can't afford housing anymore. So it goes further down and down, and the housing prices for more and more groups basically go up. So this is one big mechanism that you see in many places. And it's never a constant development. There's always some hiccups in the process. Uh, there might be some times where the mortgage just become less available, but over a longer period of a number of decades, this is a trend we see very widely. Mm -hmm. Brazil is a nice example because you see how the government is not just uh, regulating the mortgages for the middle classes, 
but pushing them very actively on the working classes and a lot of them precarious working classes that don't have a stable income over multiple years. Mia Casa Mia Vida in Brazil is a very clear example of rolling out possibly the largest uh, housing construction scheme, uh, housing subsidy scheme and mortgage promotion scheme possibly in the whole world. Well, they, they copy that from, from us. Yeah, so you, you, you should tell me more about that rather than me explaining it to Our you. Our expansion of the Chilean model. You said that uh, Germany sold their public housing very fast? Yes, so uh, people often think of the right to buy in England when they think of massive privatization of affordable housing. And it's true, Margaret Thatcher introduced the right to housing, was a big change. Uh, more housing was sold in the following years under Labour governments. Uh, but most of the privatization in the UK happened to individual households. So this was in a way promoting the mortgage markets, but it was promoting our ownership among uh, a wide part of the, a large part of the British population. But what happened in Germany, in a much shorter period of time, eight to ten years, a larger share of the affordable rental housing was privatized, but not sold to tenants or to other individual households, but sold by and large to large um, funds, mostly listed on the stock exchange. Mm -hmm. So these funds are mostly German funds. Mm -hmm. But it doesn't mean that the money is German. So a lot of that money comes from the city of London, Wall Street, uh, and they then get the money again from pension funds. Mm -hmm. So this is not, in the beginning, some of these investors were private equity funds, hedge funds, you know, quick capital. They invest because they want to buy for a low price and sell within a few years for a high price. Most of the current investors in Germany earn it for the midterm, at least for a decade, possibly for more decades. So it is not sort of the super speculative capital anymore. But it is still capital associated with Wall Street, with the City of London, with pension funds. Uh, they now, the largest one in Germany now owns more than 400,000 units. It's possibly the largest landlord in the world, mm -hmm. unless there's something in China that I don't know about, which is, which is likely, mm -hmm. or India. But then India is less likely to be on that scale. Um, so they own um, a few million housing units in Germany, are owned by these funds, and the largest one is expanding abroad. It's having a, a joint venture with a, an NGO, a non-profit uh, in France, which is basically the main financing institution for affordable housing in France. So it's interesting that a commercial fund listed on the stock exchange with money from Wall Street in the city of London and my pension fund is cooperating with the largest financing institution for affordable housing in France. We don't know what's going to happen there. We know these funds are expanding into the Netherlands, into Denmark, into Sweden. Mm -hmm. The biggest one already owns quite a bit of housing in Sweden. Um, and there's no reason to think that they would stop there. Uh, part of this is, of course, an economy of scale. Once you own almost half a million housing units in one country, it's difficult to expand. Uh, you can't become a monopolist according to some regulations, so you have to go abroad. So we see this at the same time, and I think this is a, a long introduction to getting to your question. Sure. What we see in, in Berlin uh, is a response to this. I mean, some of the housing associations in Berlin were fully privatized. So we're talking about housing associations that owned more than 60,000 units. The whole 60,000 units were sold from being managed by either a fully public institution or a non-profit, non-commercial, uh, local, locally run institution, which was not that different from a public one. They're being sold on block, as they say uh, when, they, when they talk about it there. On block, it's being sold to these large investors. Um, so this is the background, what happened in Berlin and other cities. Uh, Berlin is often mentioned, but actually this happens as much in Eastern Europe, of, sorry, in East, former East Ber uh, Germany as in West mm -hmm. Germany. People discuss it also very much in Germany as an East German phenomenon, as if it has to do with former communist housing. This is not true. It happens in all states in Germany, mm -hmm. and relatively speaking, even the, the most in one of the former West German states, Northern Rhine-Westfalen, the one that borders the Netherlands and Belgium, is relatively speaking, it happens a little more. But the, the differences within the country are very small. But of course, Berlin is a different political culture. Uh, more contestation, resistance is more ingrained, you could say, in the veins of, in the, maybe in the DNA of Berlin. So they want to renationalize some of this housing. Um, so it's going to be difficult. Um, I hope they succeed. Um, so this would be one way forward to say, like, okay, we have a referendum. We, the people, say we want to renationalize housing. But of course, that, that takes money. Um, yes. Investors have rights too. Mm. You can say like, okay, maybe we comp don't compensate them for how much they say the housing is worth, but we could have to come up with something else. Mm. But I think it's going to be very difficult. Uh, investor protection, according to EU rules, according to international rules, 
is very strict. So if they manage to do this, I think it's going to cost a lot of money. Um, so the question is, is this the best way? Some of these large investors um, are heavily gentrifying neighborhoods. Other ones are not. Other ones are actually trying to keep their rental prices up to a level where their tenants can uh, get housing subsidies from the German government. So I don't know if this is the most useful housing to buy up. The ones that are heavily gentrifying, yes, but the other ones are being rented out for relatively fair prices. Why do they do this? Because the current welfare system in Germany, um, it doesn't pay the tenants uh, the subsidy to help them pay the rent. The subsidy can go directly to the landlord. So if as a landlord you own thousands of units that you lend out to low income people, you don't have to collect it from all these individuals anymore. You can collect it, the subsidy directly from the state. So this is a business model. And we can say, like, well, this is exploiting the welfare state. It's partly true. At the same time, um, these people would get the subsidies anyway. Um, of course, they maximize what they can do within that subsidy, how much they can get. So if, if the state says, I'm just making up a number, we can ask 600 euros and we still subsidize, they will ask 600 euros. But that is in a European country, 600 euros for a flat is a quite decent price. Um, so these are not necessarily the worst landlords. Uh, some of them might be, but a lot of them actually rely on renting out massively to moderate income people. Because this is where there's a huge market in some of these places. Um, so there's many other things, I think, that you have to do. I don't believe in having one solution. I think there should be as many different solutions as possible. And also, in some places, one will work better than the other one. So I think another one is just building new social housing. Which I'm not sure if that will be cheaper or more expensive than buying up the existing one especially if some of the existing one is actually rented out affordably. So I think, especially in places where there is new construction, it's very important to do new construction in the social housing sector. Okay. One way uh, to do this also is to use zoning laws, mm -hmm. which many countries have but don't use, mm -hmm. which sometimes you can use at the local level, even if there's no national regulation for this. You can say, if you want to develop housing here, I'm making up a number again, 30%, should be social housing. You can say what that should be. Then developers will say they will make less money, might be true, but that means the land prices will go down. If they know that one third of the housing will have to be affordable, they will pay less for the land because one third of it will have to be affordable. And then you can do that in all kinds of different ways. You can say, like, okay, you need to build that housing, a nonprofit will run it. This could be a good way. You can say you have to partner with a nonprofit. This is what typically happens in the Netherlands, the country where I'm originally from. Uh, one other way to do it is what's very popular in cities like New York where they say 20% of the housing needs to be affordable for at least 20 years. This is great, but after 20 years, the rent prices go up. Another way is, I think, to legalize squatting if housing has been empty for more than a year. Okay. Um, this does two different things. On the one hand, it makes it possible for people to organize themselves and get the housing that is being occupied by banks or by investors who are not using it. Mm -hmm. The other thing that this regulation will do is that it will uh, provide an incentive for landlords and specul uh, speculative investors not to keep their housing empty. Yeah. So even if some of it will not be used by squatters, it will at least make sure that people have to bring this housing on the market. You can use it for Airbnb. You can use it for, well, you, 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 can, you can regulate Airbnb too, right? Uh, Airbnb now in many cities is, is starting to see that they need to cooperate with the regulators. In that sense, it's very different than Uber, who is trying to evade every time of regulation. I think Airbnb in more and more cities is being forced by local governments mm -hmm. to cooperate, to give out their data, to tax, to not allow these things. So Airbnb um, by local governments should be heavily regulated. Um, I mean, the way it started as a sharing economy was great, nice idea, but most of it is landlords just buying up units, renting them out. So there's all kinds of different things. And I think another thing is local initiatives. So um, I take my students every year to the city of Rotterdam. And there's local organizations that just try to get buildings either from private landlords or from social landlords, sometimes buildings that are need renovation. They're awaiting renovation or they're awaiting demolishment and they will manage the building for a few years before it runs out. There's some architects involved. They make sure the building is uh, fireproof, you know, it's fire safe, whatever. Mm -hmm. the, the minimum regulations are there. These are not the most luxurious units. They keep them for a few years. They rent them out to people who temporarily need housing. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of people who temporarily need housing who otherwise would be uh, on the streets 
or students um, and people who are temporarily somewhere. And so they, they use those things. There's all kinds of initiatives you can do. Um, tenant collectives become more popular uh, as well, where people try to organize. So I think all these things should happen at the same time. Um, on the one hand, I'm very sympathetic to people who want to do everything nonprofit and outside of state, and I think those things should happen. But I think at the same time, we have to convince the state at the local level and at the national level, and in some countries where it matters the regional level, to take action. Uh, so I think we should do both the grassroots initiative and the state, um, because the number of people who need more affordable housing is so severe that we need to do this in different ways. Mm -hmm. Uh, regarding Karin's discussion in Chile about the new constitution, um, and you can answer it in abstract terms, how should private property and the subsidiary role of the state be treated to ensure that the use value predominates over exchange value? Yeah, I find that a very difficult question for two reasons. First, because what is in the constitution in different countries is very different. In some countries they try to organize a lot of things through the constitution. I come from a background where there's very little in the, in the Constitution, everything is in separate laws, and we never talk about the Constitution. It's not something that's mentioned. So for me to think about what's been the Constitution is difficult. The other one is, is because it's very difficult to use the terms use value and exchange value in more sort of legalistic terms. So there's two, two different problems there. So maybe think about more what we can do with land and private property in law in general. Mm -hmm. Maybe not necessarily the constitution, maybe in Chile it should be in the constitution, maybe in other countries it's fine if it's in different laws. Um, I mean there's a primacy of private property usually in, in law. Uh, there's critical law scholars who have written about this, um, who I think could tell in much more detail how you should frame this. I'm not sure how you should frame this, but I think there should be something in there that allows for more communal forms of ownership, that allows for um, different claims to the land than ones based on buying and selling. Um, so those would be two things. Uh, another thing you could think of regulating is thinking about separating the ownership of the land and the ownership of the real estate on top of it. Uh, and this is, of course, another way to think about doing affordable housing. So community land trust and things like this. Separating the two things? Separating, separating construction and land? Yes, because uh, this would allow, for instance, to keep the land in uh, communal uh, ownership, while the property itself could be private uh, property. Now, we theoretically separate land from the building, mm -hmm. but in practice you always buy the land and the building together, right? Mm -hmm. But there are systems where you can do this in different ways. So community land trusts, uh, for instance, are one form. And again, in every country, based on how it's legally organized, it may be called something else. Um, there's, there's several cities who have tradition of um, land leases, uh, not land leases uh, privately organized, but publicly organized, mm -hmm. um, where you can say the land underneath the housing is owned by the local government. It could be owned by a non-profit as well. It could be the crown in England, but for instance, uh, the city of Amsterdam used to own most of the land in the city. Mm -hmm. So even if you had your own house, you would still rent the land from the city, which means that the increase in the land value in theory could go to the local government. Mm -hmm. This is not the way it was organized anymore for many years in Amsterdam, but there's other cities around the world who've done this. Uh, places like Singapore, uh, a super capitalist country, is also the states where the local state or the national state, of course, in Singapore are one, they are heavily involved in the land. The land, a lot of it is publicly owned, which means that if you own the land, it is easier also um, to, to build social housing or to say if money is being made by private companies or by private individuals, you can still do land value capture through the land because you own the land. So there's all kinds of ways and you could say, I mean, one ra very radical thing would say in the Constitution, we don't eradicate private property, but we eradicate uh, land ownership on the private matter. All the land is owned by the people. That's one way you could do it. Mm -hmm. It would be very difficult, but it would be a very interesting way. People would still own their houses. People wouldn't lose their houses. We're now in a very rich neighborhood, right? Most people probably own their houses here. They wouldn't lose their houses, but they lose the land underneath it. So they can keep living there forever. But from now on, the land is municipally owned. So the land lease will be a way of paying um, 
property tax, for example? It could be a way of paying property tax, but you can do that when people still own the land. That's another way to do it. Just say, like, you own land in a very expensive location, you pay a higher property tax. This is what many countries already do. I don't know how it's organized here. Uh, but one other way would be to say, like, okay, the actual increase of the value of the house plus the land is actually the land. Rebuilding the house is a few percent more expensive each year, but if the price of the two together go up with 10%, per year, then most of it is actually the land value that goes up. Mm -hmm. This is actually, that means you need to pay more money to the state. You don't own the land, um, which means that the housing cost would just be the construction cost. Anything else would be in the land. Mm -hmm. To organize this is not easy. I mean, the way I'm saying it now is one thing you have to do proper calculations. You need very good law scholars. Mm -hmm. You need very good economists to do this. Because you need to do very good calculations. And the way to put it in law, as I said, there's critical law scholars who thought about this a lot. And they can put this in terms that, you know, we don't even know how to start talking about this. Sounds interesting for the future. Um, so, um, in a recent paper on housing theory and society, you sustain that there is exploitation in housing and through housing. And I'm going to repeat, you just mentioned overaccumulation through the secondary circuits. Right? Yeah. Um, so, can you describe that idea and maybe expand on the abuses that fuel the current crisis in Chile. Yeah, so, so in the Marxist tradition, um, and I'm, I'm not a, a Marxist, but I like, to, I like to pick and choose. I'm very eclectic in a sense. Uh, in Marxist theory, of course, um, exploitation happens through labor. There's a big debate where Harvey, who most of us would see as a Marxist, many Orthodox Marxists don't like Harvey because he doesn't talk that much about labor. Um, so Marx talks about primary exploitation happens through the labor market. You sell your labor for too low a price, the profit goes to someone else, the basic principle, there's all kinds of additions to that. Friedrich Engels then talks about secondary exploitation, which is in their sense always secondary to both to Engels and to Marx, which happens through the housing market. So what is not taken from you through labor um, can be taken to you through the housing market. And in social reproduction. Yeah. In social reproduction more generally, yeah, that's true. Um, so one thing in which this happens is if you get a higher wage, what may happen, yes, you can buy this bigger house, but if we all get a, get a higher wage, we just all pay more for the same housing. So what tends to happen a lot, and Pierre Bourdieu uh, wrote about this quite a bit too, is that um, all the additional income you may get, or social security, tends to be eaten up by housing. So whether you rent or whether you own a house, whatever additional income you get, it tends to be lost through the housing market. So when people make progress in the labor market, and they do this as a social class, as a social group, this may mean that actually, by and large, they can spend more money on housing, which means they will drive up the housing prices or landlords will ask them more. Mm -hmm. So this is the secondary exploitation that happens in a very general sense. Mm -hmm. Uh, through the housing market, it happens in a very specific sense, in many specific senses, like in the housing market. The role of the devil's advocate, yeah. that I would say, well, if, if wages increase, yeah. so prices increase, yeah. but they don't go together, right? Yeah, but um, it doesn't necessarily uh, mean that the existing housing, why should the existing housing become more expensive? Mm -hmm. If you already own a unit that you're renting out, why should that become more expensive? Mm -hmm. You already own it, your, your costs don't go up. So most of the housing we have in, in most places in the world is always existing housing. New housing is only one part of the market. It's, all, it's the smaller part of the market, unless you have a boom town. Um, so the existing housing prices don't have to go up when, uh, when labor becomes more expensive, because the labor is already in that house. It's been built by past labor, right? So they don't have to go up. But of course, in a capitalist place, you will rent out the house for the most money you can, or you will sell it for the most money you can. So for that reason, the housing prices can go up when people get a higher income or when they get better social security or better pensions. So this is what will happen, not just in new housing, but also in existing housing. Um, so this is the exploitation that happens quite generally through housing, you could say, for the wider population. Mm -hmm. Then we have many specific forms of exploitation in housing that happen uh, irrespective of this other process. Mm -hmm. And there's many examples, and they typically hit the weaker groups in society, lower income groups, uh, migrants. Uh, you can also think of handicapped people, homeless people. Uh, and these are all kinds of forms in which people have to pay more than necessary. Where actually poor people may have to pay more, relatively speaking, uh, than rich people. So one example is redlining, where poor groups, typically migrant groups, are excluded 
from buying houses in certain neighborhoods. Mm -hmm. This means they need to buy somewhere else, which tend to be uh, places that are less good locations, um, more stigmatized, um, further away from transportation. And if a whole group of society needs to buy houses there, they may actually be propping up the housing prices in those bad neighborhoods because they're forced to live there. So I wrote my PhD on this for the Netherlands and Italy. This is a process widely researched in uh, the US and in a number of other countries. Um, so this is one thing that happens. Another thing, subprime lending that we saw 10 years ago, predatory lending in the US, is another way in which this happens. Another thing that happens is stacking up migrants where they rent um, in one apartment of 40 square meters, they have 10, 10 or 20 people living. Yeah, we had that a lot of here. Or you have people renting a mattress. So, um, and these things can go together. So, one neighborhood that I looked at in my PhD in the city of Rotterdam, the Netherlands, you had redlining. Because of that, people couldn't get a mortgage. So, what happened, um, private landlords, but locally organized ones, not the big funds, were buying up the housing from homeowners who wanted to move out of this neighborhood, who couldn't sell to new homeowners because they couldn't get a mortgage down. Mm -hmm. So small landlords buy up the housing and they actually rent out this housing for very high prices because they rent it out to undocumented migrants. Mm -hmm. And so a few Latin Americans, but more uh, Africans and East Asians living in these housing units, often renting by the mattress. So you can, you can rent a mattress for, um, there were different prices depending on the quality, the lack of quality, but you can make a lot of money on these housing units, more than you would get for a bigger unit in a more expensive neighborhood in a nice part of the city. You can make much more money on this cheap housing. So this is one particular way in which exportation happens in housing to the most vulnerable groups who don't have any rights. Mm -hmm. Because if there's a lack of housing and most cities in the world have a lack of housing, mm -hmm the most disadvantaged groups are going to be exploited more because they have no other choice. Mm -hmm. So the low income are worse off than the high income, low income migrants are worse off than low income natives, mm -hmm. and then undocumented migrants are of course the worst off. So they can be exploited in all kinds of ways uh, and they may be forced to live in this kind of uh, ways where not only they're overpopulated mm -hmm. in, co in housing that's sometimes even too low to actually live in, they might even rent for part of the day where a mattress is used by more people throughout 24 hours. So this is one other specific example. There's many more other ways in which abuses happen in housing to the more and more vulnerable groups. So trying to build up from the particular mechanism uh, to the role of housing in the growth of inequalities. I was showing you uh, just a minute ago that the differences between income inequality gaps and wealth inequality yeah. gaps and the role of housing in that. Uh, how they grow from this little yeah. mechanism. Yeah, so there's, there's, there's many different things again that are going on. So I, I, I remember one of the things you, you were pointing out is Sweden has very low income inequality, but high wealth inequality. And one reason is, um, and the Netherlands is similar in that sense to Sweden, they traditionally have large rental sectors where poorer groups live. So the poorer groups don't own much. Um, it's not that they have little wealth, they have almost no wealth because they rent. And in a way, their rental security is relatively high, so it's not necessarily a huge problem. But the, but the other groups in society, the richer groups, the middle classes, the upper classes, they, they own, so they, they own property. Well, you would see in some uh, poorer countries where there's no well-developed rental market or an affordable rental market, that poor people in a way are forced to own their housing units. So even though they may own very little, they may actually own something. So in that sense, the differences in, in wealth may be sometimes smaller or they may, they may be similar to the ones in income, while you would see in some countries with a well-developed rental market and an affordable rental market, these differences may be bigger. So this is one thing. Another thing is, of course, what happens with taxes. So uh, France is an interesting example there when you look at income before and after tax. And it's a huge difference because uh, the rich people make a lot of money in France, but they also tax them a lot. Belgium is in that sense quite similar, where taxes are very high on income, uh, but less high on wealth. So there's another way, it's like, are we taxing income or are we taxing wealth? Many countries that we think of as welfare states tax income much more than wealth, which means that wealth inequalities can increase much more over time because it's accumulated income. So even though you lose part of your income, if you still build it up over the years and over the generations, yeah. the wealth cap can increase much more than the income cap. 
So, um, if politics reproduces this ideology of capital, as you mentioned in one paper, um, what alternative ideologies do you see for a non-neoliberal future? Um, yes. Hmm. Or how can we imagine property in that future? Yeah, so another tough one. So, I, I think w one thing is the thing I mentioned before about separating the ownership of land and the ownership of the building on the land. This is one thing. Um, so, you have to rethink what property means, what private property means, what land means in this sense. Um, so I don't think you have to collectivize everything. I don't think you necessarily need a socialist or communist alternative, although this is definitely one to consider. But you can have one. And uh, by the way, this separation of, of land uh, ownership from property ownership, this is the original liberal idea, right? Mm -hmm. So when I say something like this in this day and age, or in the last, you could say the last 30 years in society, any society almost, this sounds super communist. But actually, these are not communist ideas. These are ideas from the liberals. So, um, in the Netherlands, we've had a prime minister who's from the liberal party, and liberal in the European context, meaning right-wing, neoliberal, conservative. His big hero are the liberals from the early 20th century. He probably doesn't know them very well, because they advocate exactly for these kind of things I say now. So this is, in a way, this is the liberalism of a century ago, when liberalism was, in a way, um, uh, a modified version of socialism where they said like, okay, let's keep the markets, but let's see how we can have something where we have both markets and we have something that is communal, something that is organized for society at large. Um, Adam Smith talks about this. I mean, this is what social scientists who are not economists also always say. Adam Smith is not about free markets. It's about how you have free markets next to, in a way, something organized. It's called a moral philosophy. It's not called free markets. Um, so I think we have to go back to those liberals of, of a century ago and reread some of them and reread them alongside socialists, you could say, and see what happens there. Um, go back to those ideas. Uh, John Stuart Mill is a very interesting thinker about this. I would have to reread them myself as well to, to see what they're really arguing, because I've read some of it, but I haven't read all of it either. Um, so there's something there to think about. What, how do we talk about ownership? How do we talk about land? Um, how do we put this in constitution, in law? Um, there's, there's a lot of things there that I think we've barely touched upon in, in recent decades uh, to denaturalize the idea of neoliberalism. And I think also one powerful way not to convince just poor people, but to convince the middle classes who might not be left-wing, but who might be wondering now if they should still re-elect Piñera or whoever the other people are in the countries, the people who might be convincible in the middle. Mm -hmm. Because if you just have the left, it's one thing to unite the left, that's very difficult, but you have to get the people in the middle to get a majority, right? Because we don't want, an, we don't want the left-wing dictatorship either, at least I don't. Mm -hmm. uh, we don't want Venezuela to happen. Mm -hmm. So we need to convince the people in the middle, so we need to convince them not with socialism or with communism, we need to convince them with liberalism. But with the original liberalism where we say, like, okay, you're not losing your house, but we're going to do something else. Mm -hmm. This is something where we have to convince a larger group of society, and I think this is one of the few possible ways to do it. Perfect. We're just finishing. Is there any other idea that you would like to add to this discussion? In, 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 in Chile or in general? Yeah. Um, well, one thing, when I mentioned secondary and primary exportation, labor market, housing market, I think the important thing is there, when you demand a higher income, you always have to demand protection of housing as well. This is a key thing, because if you don't do this, this process happens where Bourdieu says, in the end, housing is going to eat up your income in the end. So this tends to happen, and it happens everywhere. And even in countries where it's well organized, over time, it gets worse again. So this is a constant struggle. This is not something you can put in the Constitution and you're ready. You constantly have to fight for the right to housing, to have it in law, and to have it active the reproduced to make sure, okay, if we get a higher income, to make sure our rents are not going up and the, and the housing is not becoming more expensive. So this is something to think about at the same time as you demand higher wages, um, because otherwise people are just gonna, gonna exploit this in the secondary way what they couldn't do in, primary, in the primary way. And you mean housing protection in general? Housing protection in general, uh, making sure housing prices can stay in check. And one way to do this is through, through land ownership. 
Uh, one way is also to say um, people are allowed to have private property. Um, housing prices are allowed to go up with inflation. So if the inflation is high, it might be high next year in Chile, let's say maybe it's 10, maybe it's 20%, maybe it's, it's going to be 100%. Who knows what will happen? Housing prices are allowed to go up with that much. People are allowed to sell their house for that amount. But if they go up with more, it is actually why do housing prices go up more? Because there's something happening in society, um, which means that it should be going to, to the people. Mm -hmm. It should be going to the state in this sense. So it is fair for people to say, if the inflation in my country is 3% or 10%, I want to sell my house for 3 or 10% more. But for anything above that, you could say, we cap that. We cap the house price increase by the inflation. Mm -hmm. And then if you have fast inflation, you will have to update it every three months. Mm -hmm. Where I'm from, our inflation is very low and it doesn't change a lot, so you can always do the one from the year before. In, in Chile, the inflation might change a lot in the next month, so you have to say like, okay, we always do a moving, a moving average, where we always take the average from the past year, but not just 2018, would we do you know, the past 12 months. We update it every one month or every three months. Mm -hmm. So this is one other way to say, this is how you can check housing prices not going up too much. Mm -hmm. it's, again, it's not easy, but it's possible at least to think about how you could organize this. Mm -hmm. And again, we need very good lawyers. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Thank you very much. Uh, muchas gracias a todos los que están viendo. Este fue Manuel Alvers, profesor de geografía de eh, la Universidad Católica de Lovaina, eh, en reemplazo de esta conferencia que no tuvimos, eh, pero que estamos muy alegres de tenerlo acá, eh, sobre todo en este momento difícil que tenemos en Chile. Muchas gracias.